Simple Cyber Defense Weekly Updates for April 10th, 2020. Welcome back to the Simple Cyber Defense Podcast. Today we're going to be reviewing many different platforms that are used for web conferences. Due to the current pandemic going around, many companies have been offering their workers remote access through uh, video chats and video conferences. Not only that, but many church services are doing this too. So we're going to go over the popular ones to see which ones have the best chance of not putting you at risk. The first one we're talking about is Zoom video conferencing. Over the past few weeks, the the use of Zoom video conference software has exploded. And the app has skyrocketed to 200 million users a day from an average of 10 million in December. So this all sounds really good, but unfortunately, Zoom does come with a laundry list of issues, as as we're going to discuss. Many people will wonder, like, is Zoom gonna be malware? Well, no, it's a piece of legitimate software, but unfortunately, it does have several security vulnerabilities that we need to consider. The first thing to consider is Zoom's privacy policy Come, came under criticism for making it possible to collect extensive data about its users, like videos, transcripts, shared notes, and share all this data with third parties for personal profit. Zoom did tighten its privacy policy to state that it doesn't collect data from meetings for any advertising. but it does use the data when people visit its marketing websites so that's one thing to consider Uh, the zoomed ios app like many using facebook sdk was found sending analytic data to facebook even though even if the user does not have facebook linked later it did remove the feature so that is a plus Zoom also came under the lens of its scrutiny for its attendee tracking feature, which when enabled allows the host to check if the participant is clicking away from the main Zoom during the call. On April 2nd, it permanently removed the attendee attendance tracker function. A host of Zoom meetings can likewise read read private text messages sent during the call if it's recorded locally. So that's another thing to consider. Uh, A security researcher, Felix Sedell, found that Zoom uses a shady technique to install its Mac app without users' interaction using the same trick that has been been used by macOS malware, thus allowing the app to be installed without providing final consent. On April 2nd, Zoom issued a fix to resolve the bug. Researchers also found a flaw in Zoom's window app that made it virtual made it ver- vulnerable to UNC path injection. Vul- this vulnerability could allow the remote attacker to steal victims' Windows login credentials and even execute arbitrary commands in their system. A patch was issued on April 2nd to address this flaw and other two bugs. Zoom was also found using an undisclosed data mining feature that automatically matched users' names and email addresses to their LinkedIn profile when they're signed in, even if they were anonymous or using using pseudo-anonymous on their call. 
if other users in the meeting was subscribed to a service called LinkedIn Sales Navigator, they were able to access LinkedIn profiles of other participants in the Zoom meeting without those knowing or their consent. In response, Zoom has di disabled this feature. <clears throat> Zoom revealed that Zoom is leaking thousands of users' email addresses, photos, and letting strangers try to initiate calls with each other. That's because the user with the same domain name in their email address, not standard email providers that are non-standard email providers that are not Gmail, Outlook, Hotmail, or Yahoo, are being grouped together as if they work in the same company. Zoom blacklists these domains. So in other words, it's allowing people to create emails and because they have like a at company.com, they are being grouped together thinking, oh, all these people work together so that they should be able to share whatever they want. But unfortunately, it's easy to spoof an email address to bypass this and allow hackers to take a lot of information from their, their other users. This is a big problem, and it looks like Zoom did step in. So on April 3rd, the Washington Post revealed that it was trivial to find video recordings made in Zoom by searching the company's file naming pattern that Zoom applies automatically. These videos were found on publicly accessible Amazon storage buckets. Researchers created a, cool, a tool called ZWarDial that searches the open Zoom meetings IDs, finding around 100 meetings per hour that aren't protected by any password. This is a problem. <laughs> so that means that anyone could find these meetings and just add themselves in and be able to use some other of these Zoom vulnerabilities to steal data. This is a bad part on the host and should not happen. <laughs> Zoom claims that it uses end-to-end -end encryption to secure communications were proven to be misleading. The company stated that in a meeting where every participant is using a Zoom client or which is not being recorded and which is not recorded, all sorts of contact, video, audio, screen sharing, and chat is encrypted at the client side and is never decrypted until it reaches the other receivers. But if one of the value added services such as a cloud recording or dial in telephone is enabled, Zoom has access to, to the decryption key which currently maintains in the cloud. This also makes it easy for hackers or government intelligence agencies to obtain access to those keys. This is also a problem with the decryption keys being in the hands of the service provider instead of the users. Because then if a hacker, like I said, if a hacker or the government gets a hold of these keys, then they can have free range of all the data. So Unfortunately, there's no way around this unless Zoom is going to change the way they handle their decryption keys, which will be very hard for these value-added services because Zoom would need those keys to decrypt everything to get these value-added services to work. So I don't see this uh, as a way to get around anything. And there's like many other problems many more problems. So the question is should we use Zoom or not? To give credit where credit is due, Zoom largely responded to these disclosures swiftly and transparently and has already packed a number of issues highlighted by the security, by the security community. So that is a good point that they are really staying on top of these and taking these security vulnerabilities seriously. So the biggest takeaway is really do your research and see if you are comfortable with 
their privacy policy and their ability to handle the decryption keys. If you're okay with that, just make sure that you are up to date with your patches. And I don't really see a big problem with Zoom, but many people are suggesting to stay away from Zoom and try other platforms. So, beyond Zoom, <laughs> how are the other ones? Stack up. So the risk posed by a collaboration platform is far from hypothetical. In March, for example, a critical vulnerability was found in Slack, which could allow automatic account takeovers and lead to data breaches. This was a big, this is a big issue. <laughs> because you think that your Slack is private, but unfortunately it is possible for accounts to be taken over. So you really have to be diligent in keeping things secure. Um, Collaboration apps are also subject to misconfiguration. Popular online co collaboration, collaboration platforms Trello, for instance, instance, which is used in corporate settings to organize to-do lists and coordinate team tasks, has a problem in that it is indexed by Google for its for its boards are if the boards are set to public. And public board specific contents can also be searched using a specific tool called Dork. So again, if you're going to use these collaboration tools, please, please figure out how to properly configure it. Make sure that that things are not set to public. That there are ways to put strong passwords and if possible do a two-factor authentication that would be the biggest way to get around hackers from just brute forcing their way into your platform so what are the weak weaknesses to these things there are weaknesses to these ecosystems. For instance, Slack offers a software library containing add-ons that can be installed in just a clip, just a couple of clicks. An attacker could create a Slack add-on that advertises for some great feature but also reads channel data. Add-ons could be really great, but again, just like any other software, it could also be used by the hackers maliciously because many hackers have found ways to create malicious add-ons that will do negative things and allow your data to be taken and stolen. So what are the best practices in order to assume that you will want a safe collaboration tool. To shore up a collaboration app security footprint, analyze principle. Applying principles of zero trust and network segmentation can go a long way into reducing a company's risk, according to researchers. Which basically means zero trust means you do not trust anyone. You do not trust the people you do not trust the people connecting to the platform, you do not trust the platform itself, you assume that there are people that are going to get the information. So if you have the mindset of, well, do I want this to be public data? Most likely you're not going to sit there and blab about all private things. And network segmentation comes down to you're going to separate the services so that one can affect the other. Like if you have a personal email account, 
you don't have that tied into business or vice versa. Everyone logging in and using multi-factor authentication if at all possible. If the platform does not offer multi-factor authentication, consider using something else because today it's very important to use multi-factor authentication. What is it? It's basically you log in with your password and then you have to either put in a security token from an app on your phone or some kind of biometric, like you put in your fingerprint and then it says, okay, you are who you say you are, I'm gonna let you in. This thwarts the hackers because it's very difficult for them to get your fingerprint if you are away from everyone in the situation or it's really hard to get access to those security tokens if you if you properly secure them also consider patching in a timely matter cuz a lot of these security vulnerabilities as soon as they're known they the hackers will use them to exploit the way and the faster you apply the security patches, the better protected you'll be. Another thing to consider with the segmentation is you, what you could do is buy a, a relatively cheap laptop and use that specifically only for the video conferencing. And then when you're setting up the account from the beginning, create a new, if you're using the Windows platform, create a new uh, Windows account that's specifically only used for that particular computer. Do not use it for anything else. If, if you decide to, to buy a Mac that is kind of on the expensive side, Again, just create accounts that are just specifically used just for that video conference and nothing else. That way, if a hacker does get access to that computer, they only have access to that computer and basically there's no data in there personally from you. No credit card information, no addresses, nothing. So. The worst thing they can do is just see you talk to your coworkers. So no matter what you decide to do, just remember these important safety precautions of keeping strong passwords, using multi-factor authentication whenever possible, and if at all possible, use a dedicated laptop just for the video conferencing. And if you do these things, you'll have no problem keeping your data safe. Uh, no matter what you do, just remember, stay safe, and we'll see you in the next episode. If you like what was in this episode, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing with others. For more information, to suggest a topic, or to donate, head over to simplecyberdefense.com.